So today, um, we're looking at two more fallacies. These, um, they don't fit into that family structure of fallacies that we talked about. It's not because of their content, you know, like we had fallacies that deal with emotion, and they all had some basic content in common. Or say the fallacies that deal with popularity, you know, uh, tradition, popularity, common practice. Those are all pretty similar, right? These are not similar in that respect. So why did I put them together today? Uh, what, a, what do um, false dilemma and slippery slope have in common? I, that's a rhetorical question because I don't expect you guys at this point to actually see that. But I hope that you do fairly quick. Remember we've talked about arguments. Um, we have a conclusion, right? And we have premises. And how, how could things go wrong in an argument? If, if we have a fallacy, we have some sort of bad argument. Uh, just to review, how do they go wrong? What goes off the tracks? The premises could um, be not true. Yeah, premises could be, could be false. Um, that's a big problem, right? And a lot of the fallacies that we're looking at, um, some of the premises are, are going to be false. What else is important for an argument? The evidence. Well, the evidence is the, the premises, right? Um, but then the question is, how do you get from here to here? What was, what was a word I used for that? Implicit premises. Yeah, actually, the, there will be implicit premises along the way. Um, and the implicit premises fit in with what we call the structure, right? Um, you've got premises, evidence, starting points. You've got somewhere you want to get to, but then how do you actually get to there? Well, that all depends on how you put it together, right? So, you could start out with the same content and arrange it in different ways. What's wrong with these fallacies is not actually the, um, the process of inference. As a matter of fact, both of these fallacies could be looked at as logically valid arguments. And I'll show you why in just a sec. The problem with them is that the premises aren't true. And very often people just don't see that the premises aren't. So let's actually look at the structure of these two different um, arguments before we start putting any content in. So when I say dilemma, what do you think of? We've talked about this before in class. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Like you've got more than one thing, you've got to try and decide between the two. Okay, so there, there's a key element. You have to decide between more than one thing. You have a, a forced choice, right? And if it's a dilemma, will it be three, will it be ten? It'll be two, right? Because die means two. Um, so like bi, di is coming from, from Greek, bi is coming from Latin. So imagine you're here, right? It's just sort of like that, remember that old uh, Robert Frost poem that they turn into posters, and you probably encountered it in elementary school or high school. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the path less traveled, blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, that's made all the difference. Um, it's supposed to turn all of you into nonconformist rebels, you know, um, creative types. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the path of conformity is so terrible, you know. Um, that's why uh, people, um, their lives are just awful if they follow the, you know, the, the route that other people take. Um, that's not true, right? Okay, if it's a dilemma, you've got to take one or two paths. So this is sort of a pictorial representation of it. Let's say we want to put it in terms of um, actual words in an argument. Uh, you're in a choice, and you say something like this. Either <coughs> A or B, and not A, therefore B. <coughs> well, this is actually a, lo a logically valid argument type. Remember when I gave you that list of uh, uh, argument forms? This is what we call a 
um, disjunctive syllogism. And we didn't cover this very much, but you, know, you can take me at, at my word, this is a logically valid argument. So if, if these premises are actually true, that conclusion will be true. So let's think about um, some, some real dilemmas. Either you come to class or you don't come to class. You know? Um, you didn't come to class? Well, this is going to be sort of, you know, trivial. Therefore, you didn't come to class. What would be another uh, dilemma? Let's say you're at a restaurant and they only have two menu items. Uh, steak or macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Either you have steak or you have macaroni and cheese. And they don't let you have both and they don't let you opt out. Um, you don't have steak, you're having macaroni and cheese. Right? So if those premises are actually true, that conclusion follows. You guys all see that? Um, so where could the problem be? It won't be with the structure. It'll be with the premises. And with a false dilemma, which is going to be the problematic premise? It'll be this one. So I'll, I'll just give you one example. Um, there were some people out there saying stuff like this. This is a fairly extreme view. When, when uh, Barack Obama was first elected, if you disagreed with his policies, sometimes people would accuse you of being a racist. Yeah. Right? So either you support the president or you're a racist. Um, you don't support the president, must be a racist, right? <clears throat> people were making this argument. Um, again, not as much as, as some people portray it. Now, what's wrong with that? You know, is it false that you don't support the president? Let's say you don't support the president. Well, then that's true, right? There's something wrong with this. It's saying, look, either this or this, there's no middle ground, there's no possibility of overlap. I mean, think about the different combinations. You could be, you could not support the president and also not be a racist, right? You could also support the president and be a racist, couldn't you? Yep. Um, so, these are not what we call logically um, exclusive, mutually exclusive possibilities. That's where this sort of thing is going to fail. So when we have a false dilemma, you should be looking at, not at the, the conclusion, but looking at that either or and trying to figure out, okay, what's wrong with this? Test it. There are some real dilemmas out there. I think I've given you the one uh, as an example before. This is kind of a joke, right? But uh, somebody takes his fiance to a fancy restaurant. You remember this scene? And the, the violins are playing and they're having a three or a five or seven course dinner and it's very fancy, you know, candles at the table and all that and then the, um, they, you know, they bring the champagne and what's in her champagne glass? The engagement ring, yes, and then, you know, he, she's, she's drinking and, oh, what's, what's this? And then she finds it and he takes it and he gets down on bended knee and he says, so and so, I, I, I can't live my life without you, blah, 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 blah. Blah, um, will you marry me? Now she's in an actual dilemma. And that's not an, a, a real false dilemma. It's a practical dilemma because she can say yes, you know, unreservedly. Yes, I've been waiting for this moment all my life. I'm so happy to be with you. Or she can say anything else. I mean, she could say no. No, sorry. Um, you're not the guy for me. <laughs> nice meal, though. Uh, or she can say other things like, I don't know, let me call my friends. <laughs> or she could say, can I, can I take a look at the ring for a while? <laughs> or she could say, um, yeah, I don't know, i got to think about this. Just, just hang on for a while. Wouldn't that kill him? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Anything other, than an, anything other than a clear yes really is translating into a no, isn't it? Um, if that's the case, then you would have a real dilemma here. I mean, this one's debatable. You could say, well, no, no, she should have the chance to, to think it over, right? Uh, we could debate about that one. But that's an example of something that might not be a false dilemma. Let's look at, before we look at a few more examples of this, let's look at the um, structure of slippery slope. You guys have all heard this type of argument being used. Um, one that's common in child rearing. If you steal a candy bar, then you'll. Well, we're going to try to get to that. 
um, by step by step. If you steal a candy bar, so something really small, what do you steal next? Something bigger. Right, what, what's an example of something bigger? <laughs> oh, right. uh, toy. You steal a toy. And if you steal a toy, then you'll start stealing... Cars. Yeah, cars. And then once you start stealing cars, you've pretty much lost all respect for the law. Pretty soon you're going to be killing people. And that all comes from that one thing, stealing that candy bar. So if you steal that first candy bar, you are irrevocably on the path to ruin. Not only for yourself, but for your family, for society. You know, you can go on further and further. Now, let's say we want to draw this out graphically. What it's saying is, you know, if you have A, that's going to lead to B, that's going to lead to C, and you could have as many steps as you want. You could have 531 steps, you could have three steps. It all has the same basic structure. You're all, all of it is saying that if you start down this slippery slope, if you put your foot to it, once you take that first step, you are going all the way down. And this is some sort of small step. And what's down here? Total catastrophe. So here's, here's another example. When I was uh, in, in uh, school, I think they don't show you these in, in school that much anymore. They would have these anti-drug um, films. Uh, back then, we had them on, like on uh, the projector or um, with a VCR. And what they would show is little Johnny on the playground, and then, you know, what's going to happen with little Johnny? He smokes a joint, right? Why does he do it? We've already talked about peer pressure, so we know why Johnny smokes a joint, so he can fit in. Well, what's going to happen if little Johnny does that? He's going to become hooked on marijuana, isn't he? Right? That's the next step. And then what happens? Well, you know, marijuana is a gateway drug, so he's going to, you can pick your, your choice. He is going to get hooked on, uh, depending, yeah, where, depending on where you like, crack or what else? Meth? Heroin. Heroin, yeah, if you're in Chicago, uh, one of the big drugs of choice. Um, PCP, I mean, that, that had a brief resurgence for a little while. That's not a very big drug anymore. You know, it, it's kind of funny though. Um, do you know what the most abused drugs out there are, actually? Prescription. Yeah, prescription drugs. So probably we should have them you know, start smoking pot when he's using Oxycontin or something, right? Um, but they, that's not how they represent it. It's the street drugs, right? So uh, now he's down here. Now he's you know, hooked on, say, crack or heroin or, or meth. And once you get hooked on that, your life is pretty much over until you, until you get cleaned up. And so you know, you're going to be the dirty, uh, scabby junkie on the... On the uh, Stained mattress and the, the flop house with the rats all around you and all that sort of stuff. So who knew? You know, if you smoke that first joint, you're going to be that junkie. So you better not smoke that joint, right? By the way, I'm not, you know, by making fun of this, I'm not advising anybody to use drugs, right? Um, I'm just pointing out the, the sort of inconsistency in the logic. And if you could think about each step along the way. Each of these is a premise. And it works like this. You say, if A, then B, if B, then C. This is the... This is the no, this is the slippery slope. Right? Um, if C, then B. So therefore, the conclusion is, if A, then B. If you start on that first thing, then total catastrophe is going to be the result. Now, in order for this to be a good argument, um, not only does the structure have to hold, you know, if, if these premises are actually true, this is a great argument. This is a logically valid argument. It's a version of what we call, a slightly more complicated version of what we call the hypothetical syllogism. You know, if A, then B, if, if B, then C, therefore if A, then, then C. Um, that's valid. The trouble is, are all of these premises actually true? Um, and in this case, um, some of them aren't. I mean, you could think about if, if C is um, you're using uh, meth or crack or heroin, and um, D is being the junkie in a pretty bad state, is that pretty much true? Yeah. I mean, if you get hooked on crack, 
you get hooked on meth, you get hooked on heroin, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, those are very addictive drugs and people ruin their lives because of them. But um, what about this one? This is the marijuana as the gateway drug. So if you get hooked on marijuana, let's say you're using marijuana every day, are you going to be using these other drugs? Not necessarily. I mean, some people do, right? But as a matter of fact, most potheads seem to like pot mostly. Uh, that was kind of a pleonastic sentence. Most potheads seem to stick to pot, uh, as far as we can tell. Um, they're not so drawn to the other things. And if you smoke a, uh, a joint, are you going to become a, a person who's smoking pot every day? Yeah. Probably not. I mean, President Clinton smoked pot, right? Uh, you guys remember, you know, you're too young to remember. It was, it was a famous thing. He was, you know, the first presidential candidate who would admit to, first serious presidential candidate, who admitted to trying marijuana. And he said, yeah, but I didn't inhale. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of a running joke because, well, of course he did inhale, right? He was just saying that so he could, he could uh, not get lambasted for, for having smoked. Like it wasn't that bad. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you smoke pot but you don't inhale, you're kind of missing the point of the, the exercise, aren't you? Um, that's sort of like saying, yeah, I, I take a, I, I go to the bar and I take a, a sip of a drink and then I spit it right out. Yeah. Well, uh, again, you're paying a lot for something that you're not using. But now you see the structure of this, right? Uh, both of these have valid structures. Both of these are good arguments, except for the fact that there's something wrong with one of the premises. And for the slippery slope to fall apart, you don't have to have all the premises be false. You just got to find one weak point, and then you can say, yeah, you've got a slippery slope argument there. And um, it falls apart. Which These, one would it be? Does it matter? Or could it be any of them? It could be any of them. Any, any of the premises. Um, in order for an argument to be, in order for a valid argument to be sound, all of the premises have to be true. So if one premise is false, um, it's valid but unsound, um, and it becomes a bad argument. It becomes an argument that you wouldn't rely on. Okay, so let's let's go back to false dilemma. Let's think about some of the ways in which um, your two choices might not be as opposed as you think. So again, here's our, our schema. You are at X and you have to choose between A or B. Um, either you love me or you hate me. Now, does that cover every possibility? What are other possibilities? You What's that? Like them. You like them, yeah, or to be indifferent. To be indifferent and then maybe also dislike, right? You dislike some people without hating them. So that, you could say there's a continuum. You guys familiar with this term, a continuum? There's like a whole bunch of different points along the way. So if this is love and this is hate, then maybe um, indifference is here. Difference. And maybe liking is over here and disliking is there. Yeah, that works. Um, think about another possibility. Can you love and hate the same person? Yeah, yeah you call that a love-hate relationship, right? Yeah, you can even have that with a candy bar. You know, I love it because it tastes so good. I hate it because it makes me fat, huh. right? People have love-hate relationships with all sorts of things. So would this be a thought so or not? Yeah, if somebody is saying either you love me or you hate me, that would be a false dilemma because it's forcing you to choose between two different things. Um, and it, usually with the false dilemma, you're, you're trying to steer somebody towards one of them. Um, well, you don't hate me, do you? So you better love me. Um, or you obviously don't love me, so you must hate me. Um, the problem is the two choices aren't actually opposed the way that they say they are. So there could be a continuum in between them. Um, there could be the possibility of both of those terms being true. All right. um, another possibility would be that there's actually like a third term. You know, the indifference might be a third term in that case. Uh, a third alternative. Now, you could also have a trilemma. You could, you could make a, as many as you want. I'm trying to box people in that way. 
you could you could adjust and say, well, I, I forgot to take account of that. But the the basic structure is the same. Um, your book has another, a number of great examples because um, these are easy to come up with. Um, let's look at this one. Uh, this is on page two eighteen. I like this one. Um, Teresa and I both endorse this idea of allowing prayer in public schools, don't we, Teresa? I never said such a thing. Oh, I didn't know you were an atheist. <laughs> now, we have to reconstruct that a little bit. What's, what's going on there? The person is, is not actually spelling out their false dilemma. They're sort of throwing the person into it. They're saying um, either you support prayer. In school, or your name, or yes, or an atheist. Um, you don't support prayer in school. Therefore, you're an atheist. Sort of, sort of trick in a lot of ways, don't they? If you're not for this, then you're that. Um, either you are for this, or you're this kind of person. Either you're against this, or you're this kind of person. You've got, you guys have all heard that sort of thing, right? Have you ever used it on somebody? Probably, right? Um, and there could be real, real dilemmas, you know. Um, either you actually do your homework, or you're not a good student. Well, th th those probably go together, right? Um, but in this case, uh, supporting um, prayer in school, are there, are there religious people who don't support prayer in school? Yeah, there's some. Plenty, actually. Um, there's some religious groups that are as religious groups against it. Um, they prefer to do it privately. Um, so, yeah, this is a false dilemma. And you could put all sorts of other content in there if you wanted to. Your book gives you a couple variations as well, um, and these are kind of good to talk about. One is called the perfectionist fallacy. What is a perfectionist? Some of you may have been accused of that at one point in your life. Did you do something best or better than anybody else? That's part of it, trying to do something uh, the best or better than anyone else. Why is perfectionist a pejorative or a bad term? Because nothing's perfect. Because nothing's perfect, right? <clears throat> and so what does a perfectionist end up doing? Probably a lot of trouble for themselves. Yeah. They cause, usually they're, they're more harmful to themselves than to other people. Sometimes they can screw things up for other people. By wanting things to be perfect when they aren't, in fact, perfect and, and demanding that, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot of harm, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a perfectionist when it comes to... Um, well, here's a great example. Um, if you ever do like household work, there's always some mess left after you're done. You ever notice that? Like you sweep, or you, you paint, or you fix something, and there's always something still screwed up. Right? Now, if you're a perfectionist, you can't stand that. It all has to be perfect. And so you'll invest, you know, an hour into sweeping some section of floor just to get all the dust off. Well, that means, you know, you've taken something like 50 minutes away from something else. That's the problem with perfectionism. Now, the perfectionist fallacy, the way it's structured, has to do with plans. And, and here's how it reads. If policy X will not meet our goals as well as we'd like them met, that is, how? Perfectly. Then policy X should be rejected. So, um, they give the example, actually, of the National Football League's experience with the instant replay which allows off-field officials to review videotapes of the play to determine whether the field official's rule was, was correct. Um, and then when it was first proposed, they said it's a mistake to use replays to make calls um, because you're still going to miss some calls, right? Because you won't see everything. Um, now, in order for it to be a good thing, does it have to be perfect? No. Um, Here's how it would be set up. Unless a 
Again, here's x. Alright, so the camera died and uh, recharged it and I'm finishing out this lecture before the next class comes in. Uh, we were talking about a variant of the um, false dilemma called the uh, uh, perfectionist fallacy. And when you're a perfectionist, you're saying that um, something has to be entirely perfect or else it's, it's no good at all. And that's a false dilemma. So it's really a false dilemma applied to other dilemmas. You're at a, a juncture, you have a choice, don't do a certain policy or do the policy. Um, and doing the policy is going to be a limited good, but it will be an improvement over not doing the policy. Here's where the false dilemma comes in. Unless you actually attain perfection, which is good, it's just everything else. Everything else is at the same level and it's all equally bad. So the perfectionist fallacy is a false dilemma that ignores the, um, the actual good and the actual improvement that's taking place. And here's where the problem lies. It's forcing a choice between uh, two terms, either perfection or non-perfection, when really this ought to be a whole bunch of different graded uh, choices as well. Obviously, if we could have perfection, that would be desirable, but that's not usually the case. And there, the perfectionist fallacy actually fits the, uh, the uh, saying that people have of uh, falling into the trap of allowing the best to be the enemy of the good. Because if, the, if doing a certain policy is going to be good, if it's going to have good effects, if it's the better thing to do, then there is an improvement there. The best, the ideal best, can often become the enemy of the limited good. Uh, another one that the book talks about, a uh, variation of the line drawing fallacy, which says that unless you can actually say exactly at which point something transforms into something else, uh, you can't claim that it's, it's um, different. And the, the example that they used was actually the Rodney King trial. During the trial, um, one of the arguments that was made was, well, look at the first blow from the, the police baton. Is that excessive force? No, that's not excessive force because if it was, then nobody would be able to, to use that sort of force at all. What about the second one? What about the third one? If you can't point at exactly where the excessive force began, and if you watch that video of the Rodney King beating that's, that's out there, um, you know that excessive force was used. But it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly at what point excessive force was used. Um, so here's the, the dilemma there. You can either give a definite criterion, uh, in which case some, some threshold has been passed, or you can't give a criterion. And if that's the case, then it doesn't matter whether it's the first blow, the second blow, the 138th blow. Um, no threshold has been passed. It's all on this side. Again, what's being left out here? There's a continuum. And at a certain point, um, things do transform. There's, there's some qualitative thing that's being left out. Um, we talked about the slippery slope already. And I just want to reiterate that the slippery slope is um, a valid argument, usually. It could also be, there's an inductive form of it as well, but I'm not going to go into that. Just consider it to be a logically valid argument that does not have sound premise. Okay, so once again, camera troubles. That's why all this is uh, patched together. And we left off, I was, I was uh, talking about slippery slopes. Um, I'm going to give a couple examples of them. Like I was saying, you should consider a slippery slope to be a, a logically valid or uh, perhaps an inductively strong argument in which the premises are not actually true. Um, so if you think about a slippery slope as something like this, you know, uh, look at it in chart form, A necessarily leads to B, B necessarily leads to C, C necessarily leads to D, A is some small step, 
when the steps are getting bigger along the way, D is something terrible, a complete catastrophe. If you do A, you are, you are going to end up in, in D. That would be if all the premises were true. Here's how you could represent it in uh, argument form. If A, then B. If B, then C. If C, then D. Therefore, if you do A, that little step, then you're going to do D, that, that big step, that big catastrophe. Um, now, where is it going wrong? It's not in the structure of the argument. There are some real live slippery slopes. For example, if uh, somebody gets bit by a tick that carries Lyme's disease and they, they get those rings, that's a symptom of the disease. So if you have those symptoms, you have the disease, Lyme's disease. And if you don't treat it, it will spread through your system. And if it spreads through your system, A, it may kill you. Um, sometimes it just produces organ damage. Sometimes it actually can produce death. So, you know, let's say you're in the locker room and you see somebody and they've got those rings and you say, hey, you better get that treated. You've got Lyme's disease. And they say, ah, I'm not going to do that. You can, you can actually say, well, you know, if you don't do that, you're going you're gonna to risk organ failure or damage or perhaps death. And that would be a real slippery slope. There are a lot of um, other slippery slopes that are slippery slope fallacies precisely because somewhere along here, all it takes is one. Some, one of these premises is not actually true. So it could be the first one, it could be the end one. Um, let me give you a few examples. Um, if you commit a crime, then you will be caught. If you get caught, you will go to prison. If you go to prison, well, you know what happens to people in prison, don't you? So if you commit a crime, then it's right there to the terrible thing that, you know, everybody thinks about prison. Well, actually, none of these lead to each other necessarily. A lot of crimes never get caught. You know, they never find the culprit for the, the crime. As a matter of fact, police in some areas don't even investigate certain types of crimes. Um, if you get caught, you're not necessarily going to prison. If it's a misdemeanor, you're going to jail if you're actually found guilty. But you might not be found guilty. Even if you are, you might go on probation. Um, a lot of people get off on technicalities. They plea bargain. You know, they go from a, a felony now to a misdemeanor. If you go into prison, are you necessarily going to be, what's the great stereotype? You're going to get raped. Um, you know, my prison students, uh, I taught in a prison for six years, um, some of them actually wrote quite interesting essays about the mechanics of, of social groups within the prison, and, and, and at least in the Indiana prisons. They said, that's a stereotype, and it doesn't happen most of the time. Um, it really depends on which subgroups you're, you're hanging around with. Now, if you're stuck in, in some, you know, unmanageable mess like the California prison system, God help you. But, you know, some DOCs are quite good. Uh, another great example. Think about, you know, these, these drug things, these anti-drug uh, films that we used to watch when, when I was a kid in, in school. Um, some of them were these cautionary tales. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not you know, advocating using drugs or anything like that. I'm not trying to make light of that. But the, these were kind of over the top. So you'd see little Johnny on the playground, and little Johnny um, is smoking a joint. And you know what that's going to lead to? He's going to become addicted to marijuana. Marijuana is a gateway drug, so that's going to lead to one of the big three, either crack or heroin or crystal meth. And then what follows after that? Johnny is the dirty, scab-encrusted junkie lying on a stained mattress in a terrible, dank apartment filled with rats and cockroaches doing God knows what for money. So, you know, if you smoke that joint, you're going to be that junkie. Well, that's clearly a slippery slope fallacy, right? Because at least some of these steps in here don't necessarily lead to each other. I would say arguably, and I, I've known some people who were, were heroin junkies, um, and they, you know, they cor corroborate this. If you get hooked on one of those drugs, you're probably on your way to, to junkiedom. Uh, because you, you can't keep your life together while you're using crack or, or meth or heroin. It's, it's just not possible for very long. But, so that, that's true. Let, let's assume that that's, that's completely true. 
and, and there are going to be some exceptions, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that it's a uh, necessary conclusion. You start from C, you automatically go to D. If you use marijuana, are you going to automatically shift to some harder drug? Clearly not. So that, that's a false premise. If you smoke a joint, are you going to become hooked on marijuana? Well, if Bill Clinton's example is, is uh, relevant, apparently not, right? Um, maybe it has to do with whether you inhale or not. Um, but there are, <coughs> there are plenty of people who, who try a drug and don't get, get addicted to it. So again, slippery slope. Your book has other examples, you know, dealing with military things. Um, I find those uh, interesting, but a little bit harder to relate to. So that's why I use these other examples, uh, which fit into our, our, our culture a little bit more. Um, the basic thing to keep in mind is when there's a slippery slope, if there's some sort of disconnect, if, if they say, if you do A, D is going to follow, and you say, I'm not sure about that. I don't buy that. Start looking for the connections. Where along the way <coughs> is there some sort of disconnect? Where is the premise or premises that are false? When you get a false conclusion, as you do in, in, in these um, fallacies, it's not the conclusion's fault. Somewhere along the line, the reasoning went wrong. And with these two fallacies, it's in the premises. So that's uh, what to keep in mind. False dilemma and slippery slope are both what would be good arguments, but some of the premises are false. In the case of false dilemma, it's the either A or B. Uh, there isn't a real either A or B, or there could be other possibilities. With the slippery slope, it's some one of the premises or more.